I invite you to take your Bibles, turn to John chapter 9. Usually I'm the one that has to slow her down. I normally don't have to speed her up, so that was odd. I was, I was kind of thrown off there for a minute. John chapter 9, we are working toward the end of this text, this wonderful chapter. Uh, let me just say while you're turning there, I encourage you, do remember these guys in prayers, a couple of uh, people we just kind of updated you along the way. I, uh, Summer, Miss Freedy was sharing with me. Uh, the little baby summer over in South Carolina, good report. Still got multiple things they're dealing with, but uh, so far so good. They've turned the vent down some. They've got a lot of things that are happening there. So let me just encourage you to keep her in your prayers if you would. Also, I uh, just got a little bit of news there for uh, 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 Brother David Landers. This is Pat and Max's grandson who works at a church down in Georgia, Homerville. You guys may have seen this on some news reports or whatever, but there was an explosion at a coffee shop down there in the small town of Homerville. Uh, several of the young ladies who were in David's youth group were in there burned uh, because of a gas explosion. So I just encourage you to remember there you get Homerville Free Will Baptist Church, these young people that are in his youth group. Uh, just kind of remember these guys and your prayers along the way. Uh, do encourage you to remember students who are in school, so don't forget to pray for them as well. Uh, please keep them in your prayers. Yes, sir. Good. You guys remember Brandon's grandmother, okay? She's going through that, had that surgery and now in rehab, so uh, if you guys would remember her, uh, keep her in your prayers as well. John chapter 9 is where you're at. Look with me in beginning in verse 35. Remember, this has been an encounter between Jesus and and first. And then the Pharisees call him in, the leaders of the church, the serious people. They call him in, they want to find out what has happened. They're upset because Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. He was blind, now he can see. They're upset about this. They want someone to testify against Jesus Christ. They brought his parents in, in this courtroom scene. They've done all these things. And now we come to this conclusion part of chapter 9, where Jesus encounters the blind man who is now healed, Encounters him once again. John chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. Let, let me say this <clears throat> before we get to that text. Don't overlook verse 34. I didn't share a lot with you about that last time we were together. The young man is a wonderful testimony of what Christ has done in his life. He answers all their questions truthfully, straightforward. And I want you to notice the result of that in verse 34. It says, Then they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. You know what that means? That means they told him, You don't come back to the temple anymore. We're done with you. He testifies of the truth. He shares the truth. All those things, very clear, we saw from the text. And then the church, I put that in quotation marks, then the church says, we don't want to hear your testimony. We don't want to hear about this Jesus. We don't believe what you've said. And so guess what? You're not welcomed here anymore. Now folks, we've got to be really careful within the church that as God begins to work in people's lives and God begins to change them, a lot of times, what do we do? We begin to doubt that God has changed them and God can change them. And in that process, because we don't believe, because we don't accept that, because we're naive, well, let's just say we're skeptical. Because of that, what do we do? We oftentimes say, well, God can't change, or God can't work, or God can't forgive, or God can't move them past something in their life. And so what do we basically do? We don't say it loud, but we say it there again with our questions, with our body language, and we say it with other things in our life. 
you're not welcomed here. Um, we got to be really careful of that as a church. That yes, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I, listen to me, just on here just for a minute. We don't know what God's doing in someone's life. We have no way of doing that. Now, we hope we see fruit of that. We hope that we see a changed life. We hope that we see them mature and the fruits of the Spirit coming out of their life. And we, we hope we see that. But honestly, I have no possible way of knowing what God's doing in your life. God could be doing amazing things in your life, and, and I, I, I don't know that unless you share it with me or you share it with someone else. Maybe I see a changed life. It may be some time before I see that changed life. It may be some time before I see those fruits come out. But understand, there's a lot of times God's doing a work in people. We can't see it, and it's not become evident yet. But honestly, what we have to do is trust God, that God is working, and God can change them. Church, listen to me, don't doubt God. Sometimes God's doing something that's just utterly amazing and, and we don't know it. We can't see it. We don't understand it. But He is. So my, question, or my encouragement to you tonight is trust God. Please, please do not end up like this verse 34. In our doubts or in our holiness, if that's what you want to put, because that's what they're saying, you, you disobeyed the law, Jesus. You healed a man that was blind. You were disobedient. And you did it on Sunday. You can't, you can't do this. You didn't follow our law. You didn't follow our standards. You didn't meet our, our, our quota. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't get things right. So listen to me. You're not welcomed here. That's what they're saying. Now church, to be honest with you, have we ever been guilty of that? Go back to John chapter 4. The lady had been married five times and the man she's living with is not her husband. Did Christ reject her? Was God doing something in her life that had her there that moment, that day to meet Jesus Christ at that particular time? I say yes, God was already doing something before she got to that well. No doubt there was some conviction there because some of the other ladies, there again, she didn't go to the well the same time as the rest of them. So God was already doing some work in her life. Listen to me. We got to be really careful there. Now I'm not saying we drop our stand. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's no there is no standards in the church. I'm not. I, that's not what I'm saying. But I want you to be really careful to understand. Here was these religious leaders, the leaders of the church. They're offended by what Jesus is doing. They don't even know what He's doing. They don't realize what He's doing. This man's life is being changed. Not just that He can see. He's fixing to come to faith. And they miss it all. They miss it. Why? Because, Jesus, You didn't meet our standard. And this man, He didn't say what I wanted Him to say. He didn't agree with us. And so guess what we're going to do? We're going to remove Him. In fact, you know, not only are we going to remove Him, you're not welcomed here anymore. Did you catch that? Now with that setting in your mind, read verse 35. They answered and said unto Him, that was all together, uh, verse 35, Jesus heard, we know what happened, verse 34, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had, what? Found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Whoa. Now, let's, let's back up here a minute. Put it in reverse. They cast him out. You don't meet the standards of God in our minds, in our laws, in our church. But what does Jesus do? He went and did what? What did He do? He went and... Remember what Jesus said? I came to seek and to save that which was what? Lost. He, came, he, he went looking for this young man. Church cast him out. But Jesus said, No. Nah. I'm doing a work in this young man's life. What did He do? He went and 
found him. An outcast from the church, Christ went and found him. Now, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I, I want to be careful as I say this, but just for a moment here, let's, let's, let's balance those two things out. Jesus said, I'm good. I'm good where this man's at, and I'm going to go find him. I'm going to help him. I'm going after him. Church said, we don't want to have anything to do with it. Jesus said, I want to be a part of his life. Church said, I don't want him in our life. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but that speaks volumes to me as a pastor, and it should to us as a church. Where, where are we at here? Are we going to follow Jesus Christ or not? Are we going to have this heart of compassion? R- remember where this started out. That he, had, he saw a young man that was blind, and he went to help him. He went to help those who were what? Hurting. Do you think this young man was hurt? The church said, we don't want you here i got to believe yes. Do you think he was struggling at that point in time? Was there a battle going on in his mind? Is this, should I even care about the church, the temple, my faith? Should I even care about it? They don't want me. Should I even care what they think? Should I even care about faith? Was that going through his mind? Because they don't want me. So if the church doesn't want me, I, I don't have anywhere to go. You understand? Or if you were a Jew, period. And you couldn't go to the temple to worship. You, you, you were done. Because not only was that connected to your, there again, your spiritual life, that was connected to your physical life as well. You know what? Jews didn't do business with anybody else. It, it was a family affair. They, they, they kept it in the circle there. They, they, listen to me. Everything was affected. You're excommunicated from the temple. Your family doesn't have anything to do with you. Business partners don't have anything to do with you. You're not going to find a job. You're not going to be able to make a living. You understand when he's cast out of the temple, his life is in shambles at this point. So what does Jesus do? He does what? He goes and finds him. Jesus heard this man's been thrown out of the temple and he goes and finds him. Go back to Matthew chapter 5 sometime and reread this, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for doing the right thing. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This man did the exact right thing. He testified what Jesus Christ had done. He told the truth. He was a clear, true witness of what Christ had done in his life. He stood for what was right, and guess what? He's persecuted for it. Listen to me, folks. Don't, don't get in a panic when, when culture does not agree with us. <laughs> don't, don't, don't walk down that path. They're not supposed to agree with us. Did, did you catch that? The culture, apart from Jesus Christ, they're not supposed to agree. They're supposed to oppose us. There's a reason there's a battle going over there on the state capitol grounds. They're supposed to oppose us. That's what they do. Will they persecute us? Sure. Don't panic about that. And when you're persecuted, what does Christ say? Listen to me. That's okay. Continue to do right. And when you continue to do right, what's the promise? Look what it says. Theirs is the what? The kingdom of heaven. So those who are persecuted and you continue to stand for what is right, theirs you possess, you will inherit, what? The kingdom of heaven. That's what he says. So this persecution, this that happens in our life, is not there to destroy us. It's not there to make us mad. It's not there to discourage us or defeat us. You know why that person come, persecution comes? So that it strengthens our faith and we stand for right. And why? Because then when we walk in that faith, Ours is the kingdom of heaven. And need I remind you, listen to me, the kingdom of heaven is not just talking about the eternal heaven of of God, it's talking about the kingdom of heaven here on earth that we're a part of as believers in Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Oh, oh, listen. Do you realize you're a part of the, the kingdom of God now? 
Not just in eternity. You're a part of the kingdom of God. And listen to me, it's the greatest kingdom on earth. You're a part. Now you say, well, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an American. Great. But listen to me. You're a part of a worldwide kingdom of God. You're representative of that. You're an ambassador for the kingdom of God as you live in this world. The kingdom of this earth, the one that Satan rules over, is at war with us. There are two kingdoms at war. Listen to me. That's going to keep going on until Jesus comes and establishes eternal kingdom. That's just going to happen. But you're a part of the kingdom of God. Now my encouragement to you today is live like you're a part of the worldwide kingdom of God. I, I, next time somebody asks you, what do you do for a living? You know what? Now, I, I've, I've made this in a message one time, so I'm not going to go back and re-preach this message. But you understand, your job here on earth is not what you do for a living. You know what your job is? You're a representative of the kingdom of God here on earth. That's, that's your job. You make a living doing something else so you can support the gospel ministry and feed your family and all that kind of stuff. But your responsibility, really your vocation as a believer in Jesus Christ is to work in the kingdom of God. That should take priority in, over everything else in your life. You understand that, right? So I'm just going to encourage you sometime. When somebody says, what's your job? Here's what you need to say. Well, I'm the representative of the greatest kingdom on the face of the earth. They're going to look at you and say, Saudi Arabia? They're going to ask you all kinds of kingdoms. Listen, they're going to go through the richest kingdoms in the world. Your part, I'm the representative, I'm an ambassador for the greatest kingdom, richest kingdom, the most powerful kingdom on the face of the earth. They're going to list every country in the world, and then you're going to be able to look at them and say, no, I'm a part of the kingdom of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what you are. So my encouragement to you, especially these young people who are going to high school and all the battles that are going on, I want you to understand, we are part of the kingdom of God. We're just pilgrims passing through this earth. My citizenship is in heaven, not here. You understand that. So my encouragement to you tonight is, live like you're part of that kingdom. And listen, this world's kingdom is going to oppose you. Don't panic. You ever read Revelation? We win in the end. So hang in there. This, what did He do? He stood up for Jesus Christ. Then Jesus heard, He went and found Him and said unto Him, Dost thou believe in God? Listen, this man truth. And He was cast out of the church. Go back to chapter 1 of this thing. Jesus always sees hurting people. Jesus always finds rejected people. The woman at the well, let's just keep going. I, I dare say Nicodemus was not high on the list either of his group. You see, Jesus' Beatitude sermon, Matthew chapter 5, beginning of verse 1, all the way through verse, really, of the entire chapter 5, but I want you to understand, gives us the clear, concrete truth that we're going to face persecution. This life is not going to be easy. There's a great reversal of this world that's happening. And it's still going on. But then look at the question that Jesus asked him. Do you believe on the Son of God? This is probably the hardest question Jesus could ask him. It's got deep theological implications. It includes really... Uh, at least up to this point, one of the most obscure titles that Christ has ever used, the Son of Man, the Son of God. Why do you believe? Wouldn't that have been the easy question? Do you believe? But I think Christ is looking for an honest answer from this young man. The man is completely truthful up to this point, but the question is, will you continue to follow in that truth? Perhaps that's the question we all got to answer in our life tonight. Do you believe in the Son of God? Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe, there again, we sing it, we say it, 
And let me remind you once again, if you believe it, it changes the way you live your life. You don't believe something if it doesn't change the way you live. You understand that? Don't tell me you believe if it doesn't change the way you live. Don't tell me you believe if it doesn't change the way you act, the way you think, the way you respond. Don't tell me you believe if it doesn't change anything about your life. A lot of people walk out after teaching or Bible studies or worship services and say, Oh, Brother Mark, I'm so, I'm so thankful there again. That's the truth. Keep on preaching it. Well, if you believe it, live it. Live it. There's no need to keep coming to... Well, just live, okay? So what does the man do? I like this. Jesus asked him a question, and then he comes back to Christ, and here's what he says. He answered and said, Who is He? Who is He? Do you believe that I'm the Son of God? Who is He? Then notice the word that follows, Lord, that I might believe on Him. It's amazing that this man is so impressed by Jesus and what He has done in his life that he's ready to believe anything that Jesus tells him. You just tell me who He is, I'm going to believe. Folks, catch on to that just for a minute us as Christians, are we so consumed by Jesus Christ and what He's done in our life that He changed us, that He redeemed us, that He blesses us every day? And we sing about that and we say that. Are we so consumed and overwhelmed by this love and grace that God pours out on us that honestly, listen to me, whatever Jesus says, I'm, I'm doing it. See, that, that's what scares me. That's honestly is the greatest fear that I have about us as Christians. That we understand we're saved by the blood of the Lamb. That we understand that God has redeemed us. We understand all that God does for us every day. But honestly, folks, understand, if, if, we're, if we understand that and we can grasp that in our minds, shouldn't we as Christians say, Lord, whatever You say, I'm going to do it. Whatever you say, I believe. Whatever you ask me to do, I believe. I'm going to follow that God because listen, there is none greater than you. You have, Lord, you have blessed me. You have saved me. You redeem me. And God, it doesn't matter what you ask or what you say, I'm going to do it. Is that the way you view Jesus in your life? Is it? You see, I, I, don't, I don't think we're there. Because you know what we do? We, we, we read the Word of God or we hear it taught or we hear it preached and we say, yeah, that's good. I'm going to have to think about that for a while. Isn't that what we do? Now hold on a minute. <laughs> Here, here's what you're telling me. The person who, who saved your soul from eternal hell, who brought you out of the miry clay, who set your feet on the rock to stay, the one who gave His life for you, the one who redeemed you, the one who constantly gives you life and breath every day, the one who supplies all that you need, the one that gives you peace and understanding and joy in your life, the one who gave you the ability just to stand and breathe, that person, that person who has come into your life, he's going to ask you to do something, or he's going to tell you something, and you're going to go, hmm, let me think about that for a minute. That, that's what you're doing. Now you're saying, Brother Mark, that, 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 that's not real. Yes, Because <laughs> if you don't, when Christ speaks, and when you read His Word, and the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, if you just don't go, yes, that's what I'm doing, that's the way I'm going to live my life, Lord, I believe, and it's going to change. If you don't do that, and you understand what you're doing, I could simply ask you the same question. Do you believe? Do you really believe? Are you willing that whatever Jesus says, I'm doing it. Wherever He sends me, I'm going. Whatever He asks me to do, I'm doing it. That you are so consumed, you're so amazed at what Jesus has done in your life, you're so overwhelmed by what He's done that you say, Lord, <laughs> just, just, just name it. You see, listen to me. That's not only what God expects, that's what He demands in our life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Read Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. 
You see, Christ, Christ is this... this I, I, we talked about this in a Wednesday night class one time. My, my relationship with Jesus Christ is supposed to be so exclusive that it's Him and no one else. Now here's the great thing. When I seek the kingdom of God and He becomes my all in all, when He becomes the only one in my life, listen to me, He adds all these other things like people in my life so I can love, like my husband and my wife and my children and the church. He adds all these things there when I seek the kingdom first. When I say, God, You're it. You're the one and only. He just, wow, He opens this door in my life. And sometimes we look around and we go, man, how, how do they... How do they get that and I don't? How, how, how do they enjoy that? How do they consume? How do, how do they get that and I don't? It's because, listen to me, you've never come to the point in your life where you just said, Lord, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you ask. I'm here. I believe you. I'm going to do it. See, when you get to that point, then God can say, oh, listen, let me show you something here. But until you do that, listen to me, He, he, he can't do it. See, you're not seeking first the kingdom of God. You got the kingdom of God in there. <laughs> it's just not first. Are you, no, you, know, you, got a, you got another relationship that's consuming your life. Or you got another priority that's consuming your life. A vocation. I, I don't know what it is. You got something else consuming your life other than Jesus Christ. And you wonder why He can't do what He should be doing and wants to do in your life is because you never said, God, it's you and nothing else. You know what we like to do? I'm going to meddling here just for a minute, but stay with me. You know, you know what we like to do? We always like to have our, 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 our safety net on the side. I surrender all, but I'm going to have my safety net right here. Because <laughs> God, listen to me, if you ask me to do something too hard, or I, 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 I'm, I'm going to come back to here. Here's my safety net. Listen to me, you're not going to like me for saying this. But as long as you've got that safety net, as long as you're holding on there, God cannot and will not do in your life what He wants to do as long as you're holding on. Did you know that? I, I found that out years ago when I stepped into the ministry. You, you keep holding on that safety net, listen to me, you, you'll never do. Because God, God knows your heart's not in it. He asked this young man, do you believe that I'm the Son of God? And this young man answered, look what he said, Lord, just tell me. Just tell me. You see, this man was prepared on the basis of who this man was. Jesus Christ. His Word alone. Just His Word alone was enough. Because this man had changed his life. And whatever he says, I don't know if you're the Son of God or not. I don't know who you are. But listen to me. I believe. He didn't know everything yet. He didn't have all the answers. He didn't know all the theological truths here. All he said is, this man has changed my life and whatever he says, I believe. Are you at that point in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Is that where you're at? Look at verse 37. And Jesus has said, here we go, this gets good. Then Jesus said, thou both seen him and it is he that talketh with thee. That's the answer. He gave him the answer. Jesus reveals enough of himself to make faith possible, but he hides enough of himself to make faith necessary. Folks, listen to me. It is for by grace you save what? Faith. It's going to take faith to believe. It's going to take faith in Jesus Christ for this all to take place that I'm telling you. Because this world says, hold on to that safety net. This world says, no, don't, don't give it all. Hold on to one corner of that heart. Hold on, don't you give that up. Because when you surrender it all, you don't have control anymore. Jesus revealed enough. This man had heard other people. No doubt somebody, a doctor or other people had come by, probably even some people not 
They're even involved in Christianity or Judaism or anything and probably tried to heal him. No telling how much money his parents had probably paid to try to get him to doctors. He'd heard about others perhaps that had Jesus had healed. But something about this man Jesus is different. Why? He's the Son of Man. He's the Son of God. You see, I'm convinced tonight that Jesus has done everything He can to help us believe. He's revealed to us, to us through the Scriptures, through His Word. We've seen Him here very vividly clear in Scripture. And now He speaks His Word to us. It's amazing how John presents Jesus Christ once again. He presents Him as a historically authentic Jesus. The Son of Man. Physical, there. The Son of God, historically, He's presented to us. John presents confession by this man after he's been interrogated time and time again by all those that should know different and understand differently. But this man cries out and he states again, this is the Son of Man, the Son of God. Now, why is that important? Remember who John's writing to. John's writing to people who are being persecuted, perhaps put to death for their faith in Jesus Christ. And they're questioning in their mind, is Jesus really who He said He was? Is He really the Son of God? Is He really the Messiah? Was He really man? Was He really God in the flesh? Was He both of those things? Is really Jesus who He said He was? And John writes again from John chapter 9, from an account, a man, perhaps... Some of them even knew that John was writing to. He's writing and he's saying what? This is true. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. He wants them to know historically, authentically, that this is Jesus Christ. I wish I could get that communicated to you tonight. That He is the Son of God. That He is the Son of Man. So what is the response once Christ speaks? Look at the response in verse 39. I mean 38, I'm sorry. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. This man has come full term. If, you know, if you've been reading along with me in John chapter 9. Jesus is now what? What term does he use? Lord. Lord, I believe. He's not a prophet. He's not even just a man from God. What is he now in this man's life? He is What? Lord. What does that mean? Well, lordship has something to do with a thing that people don't like to talk about now. Lordship has to do with accountability. You see, once Jesus becomes the Lord of my life, I'm accountable to Him. Just like the ruler of any other nation, you're accountable to, you would be accountable to that ruler. They lived in Rome during this time. They were all accountable to the Roman government, Julius Caesar, Nero at this time. So there's an accountability issue when he says, Lord, you are the Son of God, you are my Lord. There's an accountability there. But understand, there's not only an accountability issue that's there, which we don't like to talk about, but there's also an authority issue. This man no longer has control over his life. Now, who has, who has authority? Jesus Christ does. So you understand, when you say, I believe, you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you ask Him to come into your life, one of the things you're saying is, number one, Lord, I'm accountable to You for the way that I live my life. And I must live my life if I say that You are Lord. And let me just say something. Don't believe what anybody's telling you if they tell you different. Okay, and I, I, I got a whole sermon on this, and, I, and if you want, I'll share it with you someday. But listen to me. There's no way to separate the term Savior and Lord in Scripture. Christ cannot be Savior if He's not Lord. We got a whole group of people out there to say, oh, listen, God can save you, and then one day later on in your life, when you understand everything and you're old, that He will now become the Lord of your life. That's a lie. 
Because when Jesus Christ saves you, one of the things that you're acknowledging when you come to Jesus Christ is not only do I need a Savior, but I need a Lord of my life because my life is a mess and I need help. And I can't do this anymore and I've failed and I need somebody to take control of this. So guess what? Jesus, you're it. I am now going to be accountable to you and you are the authority in my life. You cannot separate those two things. So if you're here tonight and you just say, well, I'm I'm saved on my own my way to heaven, but I'm just going to live however I want to. I'm begging to differ with you. You're probably not saved. And you're not going to like that. I'm sorry. But that's true. Read 1 John if you want to. That's the whole background for that statement. Don't tell me you can live in sin and have fellowship with God. You can't. And if you don't have fellowship with God, you're not a Christian. Sorry. So don't tell me He can be Savior and He's not Lord. He's got to be Lord. So you don't like accountability. You really don't like authority because you don't want anybody telling you how to live your life. And here's one you're really not going to (laughs) like. It's going to change your attitude. My mom used to tell me all the time I needed an attitude adjustment. I'd come home with me happy about something. It don't matter what it was. And she'd say, you need an attitude adjustment. It's true. And part of this thing about Savior, Lord, Lordship of Jesus Christ is not only does it change, there again, accountability, who I'm accountable to. I'm not accountable. I'm accountable to God now. He's the authority in my life. And guess what? That's going to change my attitude, my outlook. I'm looking at stuff now eternal, not temporal. Read the Beatitudes. I don't care if I'm persecuted because I know that's going to bring me into the kingdom of God. I don't care. Listen, if people... Persecute. It don't matter anymore. My attitude has changed. My outlook has changed. Why? Because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. So it's all different now. So this man's encounter with Jesus Christ has given him a pathway to faith. Jesus' grace is extended to this man, his faith is activated and is growing, and truth, the truth of the Word of God is at the center of it all. He is the Son of God and believe in Him. So what is the results? Look what he says. And he did what? Look, what's the end of that verse say? And he what? Worshipped Him. That word worship indicates the full religious sense of worship that's due God. The word implies there again sanctity, deity. Now, notice the order of the verse. The man's faith resulted in worship. Let me remind you what worship is worship is the way you live your life, it's not, it's not just Sunday. We come to a worship service, yeah. But I want you to understand, what we do on Sunday morning, Sunday night, is a culmination of all that's happened in your life all week long. And you just come here to say, here it is, God. You've lived in worship to God Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday. It's so bubbling up within you, you just got to come let it out somewhere. And it's here. That's what worship is. It's not, do we do that on Sunday? Sure we do. But here, the indication is, worship got to happen every day of my life. You've heard me say this from this pulpit, if the only time you worship God's on Sunday, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Because worship is the way you live your life. It's an act of worship to God. So if this is all you got, you're missing out. This is the only time you worship God? You're in trouble. You need to start living your life in a way that pleases God. So the question I have for you tonight is, do you believe? Well, of course I believe, Brother Mark. I'm here tonight. Sunday night, if I didn't believe, I wouldn't be here. (laughs) Let me ask you a question. Will you believe tomorrow? By the way you live your life? 
When you walk into your classroom or you walk into school and things don't go your way, will you believe tomorrow in worship? When, when co-workers and, and there again, even someone in your family turns against you and it's just chaotic, will you believe then? That's the question. Do you believe? Because if you believe, you worship. And worship is a life. Not an event. It's a life. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You that we can worship You. The biggest question we got to ask tonight is, do we believe? Is it going to be tough? Yeah. Are we going to be persecuted? Sure. But that persecution just confirms that we're part of the kingdom of God. Because if we're not part of the kingdom, we're not going to be persecuted. So this persecution, it tells me I'm a part of the kingdom. And God, Lord, I pray tonight for those that perhaps have been confused somehow or another, that think somehow or another they're on their way to heaven, but they can live their life how they want to. They can live it in disrespect to leaders and teachers and parents and they can leave it and leave it in disrespect even to the church and the Word of God and some have another think that they're not going to be held accountable and there's not an authority. God, help us today to understand that it's not just salvation that I know Jesus Christ, but that in knowing Christ, my life has changed. I live differently because of my life I have in Christ. I worship Him, not just on Sunday. But with my life at school, at work, in my community, in my home. God, help us to throw away those safety nets and to sink our life completely on you. Lord, speak to us tonight that you are both Savior and Lord of our life. I'm going to ask you to stand with your head bowed, your eyes closed. We sing tonight. Do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Did that change the way you live? If you don't know Christ, I'm going to invite you to come. But if you're living a lie, if Christ has not changed the way that you live, you need to come. Lord, help me. Help me to believe, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week. As we sing, won't you come? There are things as we travel this earth's shifting sand, do you believe that transcend all the reasons? Does it change the way you live, man? But the things that matter the most in this world, they can never be and Lord? held in your hand. Is he first place in your life? I believe no safety in nets. a hill called Mount Calvary. Is that where you're at? I believe what whatever the cost. The cost whatever the cost, I believe. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to a get cross. Would you pray with me just for a moment? Lord, we thank you for these that are gathered here. I don't, God, I don't know what's going on in their life. I know all of us face struggles. Lord, you know if we believe, if we truly believe, it's going to change the way we act at school tomorrow. It's going to change the way that we act in our homes. It's going to change the way that we live in our communities. So God, I pray that You speak to us tonight. Lord, help us to understand that You're not just Savior, You're Lord as well. God, help us to be so consumed by that that Lord, no matter what You say, God, we're going to do it. We're going to be so consumed with our relationship with Jesus Christ that you, wherever You go, we're going. Whatever You tell us to give up, it's a done deal. Whatever You tell us to do or add to our life, it's done. God, speak to us. God, we need You. These young people that are gathered here, they need You. We're going to sing just a chorus of that song again.
As we sing, won't you come? I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. Put your head bow with me just for a moment as the instruments play. Would you just pray right now for those that are gathered here? Lord, we don't know their needs, but You do. God, give them strength. Lord, this world is hard. Draw close to them. Lord, there's battles that we can't even begin to imagine that some of them are facing in their life right now. God, we pray that You give them the strength they need. God, lift them up. Lord, help us to be prayer warriors for them, to encourage them and strengthen them. Lord, You placed them in our life and You placed them in our church for a reason. So God, help us to be faithful stewards of those that You've placed in our hearts and lives. God, thank You for being good to us. Thank You for being both our Savior and our Lord. Lord, thank You for all that You've done. Just for meeting here with us tonight through Your Word and through Your Holy Spirit. And it's in Your precious name that we pray. All God's people said, Amen.